heaven and earth will disappear, but my words remain forever. But no one knows the date now when the end will be, not even the angels, no, nor even God's Son. Only the Father knows. The world will be at ease, banquets and parties and weddings, just as it was in Noah's time before the sudden coming of the flood. People wouldn't believe what was going to happen until the flood actually arrived and took them all away. So shall my coming be. Two men will be working together in the fields, and one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be going about their household tasks, one will be taken, the other left. So be prepared, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Life was filled with guns and war, and everyone got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. Children died, the days grew cold. A piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come. You've been left behind. What is a man? What is a woman? What is a husband? What is a wife? What is a son? What is a daughter? And what, oh, what, oh, what is the difference between a wife and a concubine? And why is it the men seem to be able to have as many wives and as concubines as they want, but it's an abomination for a woman to take any more than one man? Now, we've been blessed, haven't we? Those of us in the body of Christ, we've surely been blessed because the Lord's shown us many things. We've been blessed for many, many reasons, but one of the reasons... I see that we've been blessed. One of the ways it's manifested for me is he's shown us stuff. He's, he's, he's providing us knowledge. He's providing us wisdom. Now, it's my testimony that I came into the body of Christ via, via the evils of the world, and he basically laid out to me pretty much where we are and who controls this realm that we live in. And then he invited me into the body of Christ, of which I've accepted gleefully, and now he's teaching me the gospel as a consequence of that. So he, he's blessed me twofold because he's shown me the evils of the world and he's also shown me his goodness and him being the only way out and the gifts, the exceeding gifts that he just continues to bring me every day and the blessings he just, they just, it would appear they're endless, just like the scriptures say. I, I feel very, very blessed indeed. At the moment, I it just every day, every day, it just enriches more and more. Now, as a consequence of that, we don't know everything, do we? Now, we know more today than what we knew yesterday about the earth, where we are, and also about the scriptures. Now, the only person in the whole Old Testament I can see that had all the wisdom was Solomon. He was the one who came closest to, to having all of that wisdom, but none of us do. So that by its very nature means we don't know everything. So that means there's stuff we still don't know. There's plenty I don't know about the scriptures. I've only just started to scratch the surface. I don't even pretend to, to, to say that I know any more than I do. I'm still learning. I'll always be a pupil. I'll always be learning as I trust you feel as well in your heart, that we will never know everything. And it's the same with the evils of the world. We know plenty of stuff. We know a lot of what they call conspiracy theories. We know a lot about the truth of the world, but by, we're far from knowing all of it. So by that, that means that it's, we, need, we need to read this book with an open mind and let the book the Bible guide us to what the truth is and then we look at the world to see what they think of that particular thing. So in that spirit, everything at the moment in this house is up for discussion, like what is a man, what is a woman, for instance. Now, just because you, cut, you, you look outside and you see a father with his son, is that, does that mean that's what the Bible's saying? I don't think so. I think it's far, far more than that. So everything in this house is up for discussion so in this video, we're going to look at exactly what a woman might be, or we're going to investigate what a woman might be and see if we can get some more ideas, some more clues as to, as to what a woman is in the holy text. So we'll go over a couple of things now 
where the scriptures have led me to think where the truth may lie that I've gone over in previous videos. So in Genesis 1.27, we can see that God the Elohim, which is a plural, created man in his own image. Now, does that mean that everything that pertained to God, he created man in that own image? So God is a plural. So God, God means God means Elohim, which is a plural word. It's a it's a plural word, Elohim. So does that mean that man also was a plural in terms of spirit, flesh, host, neighbour? In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So God created the man in his own image, and that man was created male and female, and they were a plural. So this man, H120, it's more than just one person, because he's saying that he, that they're male and female, and he created them. So, so straight away, we know, we know that it's a, that it's a plural. And in Genesis 5, we read, this is the book of the generations of Adam. In that day, God created man in the likeness of God, made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. So we've got a plural going on here that Adam, the man that was created in Genesis 126 and Genesis 127, is in fact a plural. Now when we have a look at this word man, we see that it's H120, means man, mankind, man, human being, mankind, Adam, the first man, a city in Jordan Valley. And the Chinese lexicon tells us that it's uh, redness, two races of men. That's interesting. One red, ruddy, which we call white, the other black. That's fascinating. I hadn't seen that before. Both these races are sprung from Adam. It is neither state nor plural form. And you see on and on it goes here. Now, the first time we see it is in the scriptures that I just shared. Genesis 1.26, Genesis 1.27. God created this man in his own image, the Elohim, which is a plural, in the image of the Elohim, created he, him, so created he, God, male and female, created he, them. So we know that God, the Elohim, which is a plural, created this man in his own image, and they were made up of males and females. So there's at least two people going on here, or two of these men, and they were male, and they were female. And it tells us that also in Genesis 5.2. Now, Genesis 2.15 tells us that this man is a him, is a he. So it's a masculine. And we also know that God and Lord God are both masculine as well. So what's the plural here? Is the plural in there? Or is the plural to do with a man and his fellow that we read in Zechariah 13.7? Or is it both? Now, when we come down now into Genesis 2.22, we can see that and the rib. This is where we first see the woman and the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. So this is the Lord telling us that he's taken the rib out of the H120 man and he made he a woman and brought her the woman H802 unto the man H120 and then Adam said which is the same Hebrew word as man that we read in Genesis 2.22 and Adam said this is now bones of my bones and flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man so we see here that this man doesn't have an H120 next to it because it's a different it's a different Hebrew word it's H376 so the Lord is call, is saying that the woman was taken from the man, H120, but Adam's saying as a result of Genesis 2.22 that she shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. So that's the first time we see this, this word H376. And at the, the only sort of clue we've got at the moment is that we're, we're talking about an act that the Lord God's saying about himself. And Adam's talking about that act of the Lord. That's the only real difference in the story here in Genesis, from Genesis 2.22 to Genesis 2.23. Now, this word H376, we can see that it means man, male, in contrast to woman, female. So this H376 is in contrast to the woman, female. It also means husband, human being, person, in contrast to to God. 
So the H120, that was created in God's image. And this H376, we can see that it's in contrast to God. So that gives us some clues about the difference. And we see here the first time this word shows up is H376 is a scripture I just shared, Genesis 2.23. And it also translates, we can see it also translates out to these words here, husband, any, man, miscellaneous. And the first time we see it translated out to husband is when we see it in Genesis 3.6. Now in Genesis 3, I've color coded here in blue, this is the woman, H820 and wife. So whenever we see these two words in the blue here, that means it's the woman or the wife, H802. And the husband is H376 and the, the gold here is the H120. Now, so we read the story here that the woman, the woman was beguiled by, by the serpent and then in Genesis 3, 6, we see that she gave him also to the husband, which is the H376. And they heard the vo voice of the Lord, Lord God in walking in the garden in the cool of day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees in the garden. So here we see that this is, uh, this is H120 and the H802. And this, this is the first time we see them combined in together in the one verse since Genesis 2.22 when the Lord God was describing unto Adam that the woman was brought to him to be his wife because she was taken out of the, out of the man. So we can see here also in Genesis 3 that we've got two different curses. So we've got a curse to the serpent and we've got a curse to the man, Adam. Now I've got that highlighted in green because there's a second H number for Adam. It's H121 and we, the curse goes out to that. So the curse doesn't go to the H120, it goes to H121. But we've got to him is the curse of the ground. And for the woman, it wasn't a curse, but it was, it, it was told unto her, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception in sorrow. Thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So we've got two curses, and we've got a consequence. We've got a consequence to the woman. In my She Is My Sister, Not My Wife video, I put out there that this is the first time that we see the difference between a wife and a sister, and potentially the importance of, of that. So in Genesis 12, we can see that Abram lies to Pharaoh about his wife indeed being his sister. Now, why is this important? Why is this impo so important to Pharaoh? Now, we read in Genesis 11.30 that Sari was barren. Now, would Pharaoh have known that? Well, Pharaoh had known that, but he wanted Sarah, right or wrong, to be his wife in his house because she was fair. She was fair to look upon. So when we have a look at this word fair, we can see the scriptures that it's used to describe. It's used to describe Sari. It's used to describe Rachel. It's used to describe Joseph. And it's also used to describe King David. So is this a physical thing? I don't think so. And I'll share a couple of scriptures to, just, to, just to outline why I do, in fact, think this. So Sari was barren. She couldn't bear any children, but yet Pharaoh still wanted her right or wrong in his house. And when Abram said that she was his sister instead of his wife, Pharaoh acted upon that and he just took her. He took Sari and because Abraham was, was afraid, he was afraid that if he, if he was honest about it and said that she was his wife, that Pharaoh would kill him so, she could, so she, he could have her. So, so Pharaoh, Pharaoh wanted Sari right or wrong in, in his house. And then when it came to pass that the truth came out, the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sari, Abram's wife. And we can see that Abraham also was, was very rich in these sheep, oxen, he asses, men servants, maid servants, she asses and camels. And as we read in Job 1 and Job 42, these things are very, very important because at, at the end, at the end of Job's testing of the Lord in the book of Job, that he doubled his substance. He didn't but double his sons and daughters, no. 
he doubled all of his substance, all of these what we read are animals, but I believe the scriptures are leading me to think that they, they mean far, far more than that. Now, I mentioned that I don't believe this is a physical thing, and the scriptures that make me think that is in Genesis 18, verse 11. Now, Abraham and Sarah was old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So we're looking at Sarah now as an old woman, and I don't think there's too many old women in the world that we would think that are fair, that are, that are good looking, and we would want to take them as our wife solely based on, on their looks. So I, I, that, that's what's leading me to think that it's got nothing to do with the way that Sarah looks. So in Genesis 20, we read that Abraham goes and does it again, but this time there's no famine in the land, and he doesn't do it to Pharaoh, he does it to Abimelech, the king of Gerar. So as soon as Abraham says of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister, Abimelech, the king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. So it's not because of her physical looks, because we read in Genesis 18 that she's well stricken in age, and, Ab and, and it ceased being with her as, as a woman. So it, that, that to me means that she can no longer do what women do. But she's not barren now. She's not barren because she's already had Ishmael and Isaac up, up until this point. But she's past the age of being as a woman. So, but, but past the bearing age. That's how I, that's how I read that. So this Abbey Melech, the king of Gerar, he's got himself an old woman who could no longer bear children. So it's not because of the way she looks, and it's not because of her being able to to bear children unto them. So why why is this Sarah such hot property, and why is it that as soon as Abraham says that she's his sister, that they leave that they, that they take her, and they leave her alone, if they if they know that she's if she's the wife of Abraham, and I think we get some clues about that in Genesis 12 when the Lord plagued Pharaoh. And he also does it to Abimelech too. He come to he come to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, that thou art but a dead man for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. And Abimelech had not come near her, and the Lord had, and he said, Lord, wilt thou also slay a righteous nation? And I also find this word interesting. We've got the word restore here in verse seven. Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet. And he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou thou shalt surely die, thou and all that in thine. So Abimelech wasn't happy with Abraham about this, and he basically told him that he wasn't happy. And and in verse fourteen we read him that we read that he took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them to Abraham, and restored him Sarah his wife. So the, the, are these two things intertwined? He took sheep and oxen and men servants and woman servants and gave them unto Abraham and restore him, Sarah, his wife. To me, they're just they're 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 absolutely connected. These things. Now, in Genesis 22, we read this is the chapter where we read that Isaac is offered up as a burnt sacrifice before the Lord. We read in verse two of Genesis 22, and he said, "Take now thy son." thine only son Isaac, who thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt sacrifice upon the mountains, which I tell thee of. And after the angel of the Lord comes upon Abram and tells him not to do it, he then the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of, the, out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld my son, thine only son. And then he gives him the blessing. So this is because of Abraham's faith, the Lord is giving him the blessing and he's giving him the promise. Now Isaac, right? Isaac saw all this because he was supposed to be the burnt sacrifice and his father Abraham actually collected with the wood and he put him down upon the altar to be the burnt sacrifice. So, so Isaac saw it and he had just as much faith in the Lord. So he was a witness to this thing of Abraham and the Lord, and he, his, his faith also was rewarded as, as well as a consequence of this. So we read in Genesis 26 that Isaac goes and does it as well. So Isaac, there's, here there's a famine in the land, so that's a similarity to, to Genesis 12. There's a, there's a famine in the land, and uh, Isaac went down to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines under Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down to Egypt. 
So the Lord automatically assumed that Isaac was going to go down to Egypt because of the famine, just like Abraham did. So why are they doing that? Why are they going down into the land of Egypt because there's a famine? I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. I, I pray about this and I'd love to know. But we don't know the answers to these things right now in this house. So, the, so he told him not to go down into Egypt, but he went. He went down again to see Abimelech, the king of Philistines, under Gerar. And this is the same person that we that we just read in Genesis 20, where, where Abraham went to. And he, he he gives. This is where he gives. He gives him the he, him the promise. He gives Isaac the promise as well. And we read in verse 7, And the man of the place asked him of his wife, and he said, "This is She is my sister, for he feared to say, This is my wife. Lest, said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebekah, because she was fair to look upon. Now, we know here it's not a question of Isaac's faith, because he's got the promise based on his faith earlier in the chapter. Plus, he was a witness to Abraham being rewarded for his faith, and he was to be the very, very burnt sacrifice that Abraham, that was used to, to be the very question of Abraham's faith. So we know it's not that, and we know it's not because of how we look, how they look, because in Genesis 18 we read that Sarah is very well stricken in age and she can't have children, and in Genesis 11 we read that she was barren. So I don't believe the scriptures aren't making me believe that it's because they can bear children or because they physically look good. So to me, this word fair, it's got a far deeper meaning and it's a meaning of spirituality. So a big part of my calling is why. Why are we here? Why have we been put here? What's our purpose? Now, our salvation's important, isn't it? And the only way out of this place is through the Lord Jesus Christ. But he put us here, didn't he? So our purpose in the world now is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. But why? Why does he need to be glorified? I always ask why. So with every answer to these questions that the world gives me, it just leads to more questions with me. And my whole life, I've got myself into trouble because I've always asked why. It's a real family trait. My two brothers are exactly the same. We've been, get, we've been in trouble our whole, whole lives because we always ask why. Being logical in an illogical world it ain't easy, but it gets easier, doesn't it, when you're with the Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes and dwells in your tabernacle. Now, so I, I'm quite often, as you know, in Genesis 1, 2 and 3, just to try and get, get some, just some more clues, some ideas on this. So what I can see from these scriptures is that in Genesis 1, 2, we, we see a scene where the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, when you break down, I'll put them on the screen, when you break down these words and the meaning of these words, it basically, to me, it describes the world that we find ourselves in today. And then God said, let there be light. To me, the scriptures are leading me to think that that light is the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, it's a physical thing as well, but spiritually, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the source of that light was the Lord's representatives, was the stars, was what we see in Genesis 14, 15, and 16. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let there be from signs, seasons for days and for years. So again, it's physical and spiritual because we've got the sun and the moon, which gives us our physical light, but they also play a role, as do the stars. They play a spiritual role too. And the scriptures that make me think that are Genesis 37, 9 and 10 and Deuteronomy 32, Revelation 12, along with a host, and there's a word, there's a word host, because that's what these things are. We read that in Genesis 2, 1, along with a host of other scriptures. Now then in Genesis 1, 21, we see that the God, so remember in, in, in Genesis 1, it's all God, the Elohim, that creates everything, and God created great whales and every living creature that moveth. And in verse 22, we see God charges them, be fruitful and multiply the waters in the sea and let fowl multiply in the earth. So God blessed all of these things, the great whales, every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. So he said to them, God said to all these things, he's talking to whales, right? He's talking to whales and he's telling them the charge he gave them, the reason for their existence is to be fruitful and multiply 
had to fill the waters in the sea. And then in verse 24, we read that God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. So is this after God's kind or is this after the living creature's kind? For me, it has to be God because the living creature here is being created. So we can't, it can't be after his kind before it's being created. So that, that's just leading me to think that this is after God's kind. The cattle and the creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind. And God made the beast of the earth after his kinds, after God's kind, and cattle after their kind. So it seems to me that the cattle was made of the beast's kind and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, after God's kind. And God saw that it was good. So good. It's the it's it's to repel the situation we found ourselves in Genesis 1 2, where the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and this is the Spirit of God moving upon the face of the waters. All of these scriptures that we read. Here, so up until now, the only real explanation we're getting as to why the creation has occurred was because in Genesis 1-2 that we found ourselves in this situation and the Spirit of God was moving upon the face of the waters because of this scenario in Genesis 1-2. And Genesis 1-14-15 and 16 tells us that he the, the, that the source of that light is the stars in the firmament and the two great lights. And we see that he created great, great whales and every living creature that moveth. And he's told them to be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the sea and let fowl multiply in the earth. So we've, this, this is, a, is this a command? We'll call this a command. And in verse 26, we see the, the God creates man in his own image. And in verse 27, the scriptures that we've gone over, Numerous times, and in verse 28, and God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And he tells us that he tells them that all of these things shall be meat for you. And in verse 30, he tells every beast of the earth as well, He has given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And these are the six days of creation. So these are the clues that we're getting from Genesis 1 as to why God created the earth, the host, the man, the beast, the, the whales, the fish in the sea, and all the, all the creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now, in Genesis 2, we get a little bit more of a, a clue of what's going on. So in verse 5, we read that every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground. So it sounds as though that this man was created to till the ground. This to me is the closest I can get as to why man was created, so they could till the ground. And then in verse 8, we read that the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man of who he formed to till the ground. And verse 15, and the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So to me, the scriptures are leading me to think that this means tilling the ground, to dress, to dress and to keep the garden of Eden. And then we see that the Lord God commanded the man of every tree of the garden thou may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So there's this, straight away there's this, there's this connection between the man and the trees. There's an unmistakable link from the start that this man and the trees are connected. Now, this is where we first see this word help meet show up. So this is the reason why the woman was created. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a help meet for him. So this man was created to, to till the ground and to dress and to keep the Garden of Eden. So we created the man out of the dust of the ground to till the ground and to dress and to keep the Garden of Eden. And he said, it's not good for this man to be alone. 
I will make a help meet for him. And in verse 21, this is where this starts to happen. And the Lord God calls the deep sleep. Now, this, this just reminds me of Abraham in Genesis 15 when he gets the promise. He caused the deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. So we're going to have a look in this video at help me. And we're also going to have a look at the word instead. Now, this is where we first see the word woman, H802, arrive. And the word woman and wife, color coded in blue, are both the same Hebrew word, H802. And this is where we, that I've got over before on, these, on, on, on previous videos and on the, this video, where the Lord God says the Lord God had taken the rib from the man and he made the woman and brought her unto the man, H120. And Adam, H120, says, as a consequence of what the Lord's done, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man, H376. Now this, I, 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 as I do this video, I just started Deuteronomy. I'm up to Deuteronomy 20, about 2022 20, around there at the moment. And I put some scriptures up on the screen now where it's telling us that the, that the man, that they wanted the, he wanted the children of Israel to cleave to the Lord God. Now in Genesis, now this, this is before the fall. This is before the fall. So there's been a big change after this. But in Genesis 2.24, and this is the great mystery that Paul talks about, therefore shall a man leave his father, what's a father, and what's a mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So it's very important here, this relationship between his man and his wife, because they're going to leave their father and their mother, whatever they are, and cleave unto this wife. But in Deuteronomy, I'm reading that the children of Israel, he wants them to cleave to the Lord God. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. The other thing I really want to encourage people to remember is that all of what happens in Genesis 3 hadn't, start, hadn't happened yet in Genesis 2. Now, it's probably an obvious thing to say, but it's, I think it's important to keep this in mind when we try and work, out, work our way through these things. And in verse 13, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this thou hast done? The woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And we read numerous times in the New Testament that the sin was the woman sitting and not the man, and that the man was created for the glory of God, and the woman was created for the man, whatever a man is, whatever a woman is. And the consequence to the woman was he will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and their desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, is, is it safe to say that before the woman did this, that these things were not applying? So the woman, before this sin, can we make, is it a leap to say that she wasn't designed to bring forth children? And her desire was not to the husband, and the husband was not ruling over them. Because this is a consequence of the sin, isn't it? What the Lord's saying here is a consequence to the woman. And in verse 20, we see the first time this word Eve arrive in the scriptures. So, and Adam, H120, called his wife, H802, Eve, because she was the mother of of all living so we haven't seen this word eve yet and now that she's been named eve she's been named eve because she's the mother of all living and when we come back to genesis 2 to the great mystery therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother now when we put the word woman into blue letter bible we can see just like the word man it's most complicated indeed. There's a lot of different H numbers, a lot of different Hebrew words, which translate out to this word woman. And there's a few here that are very, very interesting indeed that I'm most tempted to have a bit more of a look at. But in the interest of time, I'll refrain, such as this one here, Hebrew, Hebrew woman, Hebrew, Hebrew. And remains, remember, Hebrew means one from beyond and Eba means the region from beyond. But the one, where it shows up first is this one here, H802. It means, we can see it means woman, wife, female, woman, opposite to man. And we see here that it's H376 
that's that, that the man that it's referring to. So this woman is the opposite to the man that we first see in Genesis 2.23 that Adam says, because the Lord had done this thing, that the woman now will be called woman because she was taken out of the man, H120. And we see it's complicated. The child lexicon is very, very long, and there's plenty of scriptures to say many different things. So this is very, very complicated. And remember, remember in this house, everything is up for discussion. Just because people go to a church on a Sunday today and they get what's called married in this church and they sign a piece of paper, which is a legally binding contract to the state, not to the other person. The commitment is to the other person, not the ceremony, not the piece of paper, not the signature. It's a, it's a union of those two people and their commitment is to each other, not the state. So just because we've got this thing today, it does not mean that that's what the scriptures are meaning. In fact, I've got every reason to think it's the complete opposite because everything is a lie. And the further I work, walk on this earth, the more I'm realising that everything is, the, is a lie. The earth looks at everything on the earth first and the Bible's a second thought, but we've got to do it the other way. Well, I'm doing it the other way in that I look at the Bible first and then I look at the world to see what they say. So I don't know the meaning of these words in the scriptures. And because I don't know, it doesn't mean that what the world says it means is what it means. In fact, there's every reason to think it means something completely different, generally the opposite, because that's what they do. They corrupt everything and they counterfeit everything. So what is what what indeed is a woman and what is her purpose? So we see the scriptures here where, where the word woman is used and it's basically woman, wife, the times it's translated out, we see wife, woman, one, married, female, miscellaneous. This word's one interesting. Let's just have a quick look at that. It seems to me that it's telling us the times where this word one is in the same verse as the word wife. So the, it's interesting because they see, it seems to show up quite a lot, doesn't it? This word wife and one, it seems to be, it seems to be connected. And here we go again with these curtains in the Ark of the Covenant. And we're going to get there with that scripture, this one here. This one here, in fact, I think we're going to get there now. Curtains together. So that, that curtains together means wife and sister. Curtains together means wife and sister. So there we are. I was going to look at that later in this video, and I probably still will, but there we are straight away. There it is. And it just seems to me, it seems to me that this word one and wife and woman, there's, there's a real connection here to me. And thou shalt make 50 tashes of gold and couple the curtains together, woman and sister, with the tashes, and it shall be one tabernacle. This word one, eh? This word one. All right, so why was the woman created? So we read in Genesis 1.27 that God created the man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So these scriptures are reading to me that this man was created in God's image and they were made up of male and female and they were a plural. And Genesis 5, 2 tells us that as well. And in verse 28, we read, and God blessed them. So this is what God's God told them to do. He's given them his blessing and said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So that's the first real clue as to why the man was created. And in Genesis 2, 5, we read that there wasn't a man to till the ground. So this to me tells me that, that, that there's, that's another reason as to why the man was created. And then in Genesis 2, 15, he tells us that the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. Now, in, now why was the woman created? We read here in, in Genesis 2, 18, that it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make a help meet for him. So this is the purpose to me as to why the woman was created. Now, when we have a look at this word help, we can see that it means help, secure, help, secure, one who helps. Now, this word secure does 
show up in the, in the scriptures, and I'll get to that in just a sec because it's a most interesting thing. But just to get some clarity on what the word means, it's not a word I've really come up against in my life so far. So I thought I'd put it into the dictionary to have a look. So the world's telling us that it means assistance and support in, in times of hardship and distress. So it's to help, isn't it? It's to help, particularly in times of, in difficult times, to, to help somebody that's in need. So returning to the word, help, secure, one who helps. It's all quite consistent. And in the scriptures, it derives from H5826. And when we have a look at that, again, it means to help, secure, support. And it does get translated out to secure a few times in the scriptures. We see it three times in Second Samuel. Second Samuel, it gets translated out to secure three times. But when we have a look at the Hebrew word and the times that it's translated out, the first time we see it, yes, we're back to Joseph, the great prince. So Genesis 49, 25. So this is when J Jacob's giving the blessing to the 12 tribes of Israel, even by God of thy father, who shall help thee and by the almighty, who shall bless thee with blessings of heavens above, blessings of the deep that lieth under, blessings of the breasts. And of the womb, back to the womb, right? The woman, the breast, the womb. The blessings of thy father have prevailed above the blessings of my progenitors to, uh, to, unto the utmost bound. Here we are with this bound. And I'm going to get there on this video, this word skirt. Of the everlasting hills, they shall be on the hand of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him that was separate from his brethren. And of course, that word separate pertains to the Nazarite, the undressed vine, which is, of course, grown as a result of planting the seed, as a result of the man tilling the ground. And remember that Samson was the Nazarite, and his name meant like the sun. And in Deuteronomy 33, when Moses is giving the blessings to the 12 tribes, that Joseph, he had the blessings of the precious things, precious fruits brought forth by the sun and for the precious things brought forth by the moon and also the biggest Nazarite, the greatest Nazarite of them all was, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, these scriptures that it offers are very interesting indeed. Something interesting developed. So this, this woman was created to be a help a help, we haven't had a look at the word meat yet, but to be a help to the man. Now, when we have a look at the scriptures that offers, something very interesting emerges. So if the first one we see is in Psalms 33, 20. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. So it's the Lord. Psalm 70. Now, it offers Psalm 70, verse 6, but it doesn't, there isn't such a thing. So I thought I'd have a look at psalm 70 and just see whether i can work out which one it means and i think it may mean psalm 75 but i do think that i don't know that because the chaldees lexicon is in error but i am poor and needy make haste unto me O god thou art my help and my deliverer O lord make no tarrying so there's there's a real theme emerging here that the lord is is the help is the shield now for the man and not the woman. And we see it again in Psalms 115, verse 9. O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. So we can see there's something really emerging here. And remember, this is all from the Chaldees lexicon, from the word help, which is why the woman was created, to be a help meet for the man. But now we can see that that's what the Lord's doing. And another one it offers is this. This is very interesting indeed. So Nehemiah 3, verse 19. And next to him repaired Ezar, the son of Jeshua. Oh, goodness. That's an interesting word, isn't it? I might pop that, that one up on the screen to see what that means. The ruler of Mizpah. Another piece over against the going up of the armory at the turning of the wall. Now... This word Mizpah, I remember very, very well indeed, because the Holy Spirit has led me here for a few different reasons it, 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 since I've been saved. But this means watchtower, a place in Gilead, north of Jabuk, and the location of Laban's Khan. So here we go with Laban 
and Jabuk, and, and remember that Jacob took his two wives and passed over the river Jabuk. In these scriptures, when he becomes two bands and Mahanim, and he becomes two, and all of this two business that I've been talking about in, in previous videos. But we can see also, it's near Mount Hermon. So we see this word watchtower, and what do you think of it? What do you think of straight away? I'll ask you that question. What does the word watchtower mean to you? And then we can see Mount Hermon. So the scripture where it's used first is Genesis 31, 49. And Mitzpah for he said, The Lord watch between me and thee when we are absent from one another. Now, this is the story in Genesis 31 where Laban and Jacob are making their covenant. So remember, Laban supplied the daughters and their maids to which Jacob took as wives and his concubines. What's a concubine, right? What's the difference between a daughter and a concubine? But he, he supplied the women so Jacob could have the sons, the 12 tribes of Israel and all of his substance. And we see here that this is where we see this scripture. And Miss Parfer, he said, The Lord watch between me and thee when we are absent from one another, if thou shalt afflict my daughters. Or if they shall take other wives besides my daughters, no man is with us. See, God is witness betwixt me and thee. And Mitzpah, remember, means watchtower, and it's a place near Mount Hermon. And how we got here was in Nehemiah 3.19, and next to him repaired Uzzah, the son of Jeshua, the ruler of Mitzpah, Another piece overgoing the armory at the turning of the wall. And this is the word here that we see in the Chaldees lexicon that led us here, which is the help meet, which is the reason why the woman was created to be a help meet for the woman. So we can see words like shield and help. And now we've got armory. And this is why the woman was created. And we've got connections now. To Mitzpah. Now, as I read through the book of Deuteronomy, many, many things are leaping off the page to me. And the, in fact, it's changing the very nature of this video as I read through the scriptures. It is indeed a funny old thing. But uh, Deuteronomy 26, I read this this morning and it just, I, I, it's just like it, it was clear. It was one of those moments where the scriptures just seem so clear to me. So this is this is the Lord telling the children of Israel, I think, basically their whole purpose. And it shall be when thou art come into the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance and possesseth it and dwellest therein. Now, remember, in Genesis 2, 5, he tells us that there wasn't a man to till the ground and he put the man in the garden of Eden to keep and dress it, right? Thou shalt take the first of all the fruit of the earth with that which thou shalt bring of the land to the Lord thy God given thee and shall put it in a basket and thou shalt go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name there. And thou shalt go unto the priest that shall be in those days, and say unto him, I profess this day unto the Lord thy God that I am come unto the country which the Lord swear unto our fathers to give us, tilling the ground, right? And the priest shall take the basket out of thine hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord thy God. And this is the first fruits. This is the first fruits of all the earth after they've gone into the land of Canaan, the promised land, to till the ground to dress it and keep it, right? Verse 5, And thou shalt speak and say before the Lord thy God, a Syrian ready to perish was my father. And he went down into Egypt and sojourned there with a few and became there a great nation, great, mighty and populous. Now I've been sitting here racking my brain trying to figure out what's going on here. And I do believe that we might be able to get some answers if we pursue this. Because I think it might be all about the lineage and is, if, is this why Abraham lied and Isaac lied about their wife being their sister? I don't know. So who is this Syrian? Could it have been Abraham? I don't think so because Abraham, yeah, he did go down into Egypt, but he didn't emerge a great nation, did he? And he wasn't, he wasn't ready to perish when he did it. So I don't think it was him. Was it Isaac? 
No, I don't think it was Isaac because Isaac, when there was a famine, he went to Gerar. He went to Abimelech at Gerar and the Lord, the Lord told him not to go to Egypt. And to my knowledge, with, with my readings of the scriptures, what I can see is that Isaac, Isaac was the only one of the three who never left Canaan. Could it have been Joseph? No, I don't think it was Joseph either because he wasn't ready to perish because he was only young and the way he got there was that he certainly didn't sojourn. He was sold by his, by his brothers when they, when they threw him down the pit with the story about, the, about his coat of many colours. So the only one really for me left is, is it has to be Jacob, but was Jacob a Syrian? So who else was a Syrian? So let me have a look at the, at the story of how the wives came about. We can see it's told in Genesis, Genesis 24. And this is when Abraham sends his servant away. And he says to him that he's got to go back to his own kindred and, and find him a wife. And he's got to bring him a wife back because he can't take a wife from the Canaanites. So he's got to go back to his own country and his own kindred. And now the story hinged, the story hinged when the servant went about whether the camels were offered a drink by Rebecca as well. So we see in verse 14, and she shall say, drink, and I will give thee camels, or give, give thy camels also. And this is what it all hinged on. So if whenever, whatever woman did this, basically was the, become the wife of Isaac. And this was, and this was Rebecca. Now there's two different lineages of the Syrians and of the children of Israel. So they both come from Shem, and Shem had five sons, Elam, Ashur, Arphaxad, and Lud, and Aram. So Arphaxad, he was the third born, and Aram was, was the fifth born. And we see in Genesis 11 that this is the lineage here that goes down in, into Abraham. So who, is, who are the Syrians? So the Syrians are Haram. So this is the fifth born of Shem. So Aram means exalted, Aram or Syria, the nation, Syria, the Syrian or the Armenian people. And we see it's, it's translated out as Aram the first few times, but then from Judges 10, they become the Syrians. So every time we read the word Syria or Syrian, it's this H number H758, which is the fifth born of Shem. So they're, but they're both in the house of Shem, but there's two different lineages going on. So his father, the father, which sojourned down into, into Egypt and he was a Syrian. So when we have a look at the lineage of Abraham, we can see that Terah had three sons, Abram, Nahor and Haran. And it was Haran who had all the sons and daughters. Now he had Lot and he also had Ishkar and he also had this one Milcar. So this one Milcar, She's key. And Sari, Jasher, the, the scriptures doesn't tell us who Sari belonged to, but, but, but Jasher tells us that she was her aunt. And these two wives, Milcar, he, she was the wife of Nahor, and Sari was the wife of Abraham. So they're all, they're all come from the same house. Now, as I say, this Milcar, she's critical to all of this, I think. So in Genesis 22, this is the chapter where Abraham offers up Isaac to be his burnt sacrifice and we have the, the ram being sacrificed in his stead. And in verse 17, we have the Lord reiterating the promise to, to Abraham that he's going to be as the stars of heaven and sand which is upon the seashore. Isn't it funny that we're here again when we're trying to work out what a woman is? Now in verse 20, we read that Abraham gets word that his brother's sister Milcar has bared more sons. And we see the name of the sons in verse 21 and 22. And the last of these, their name is Bethel. And this is the first time we see this word Bethel. And Bethel, of course, begat Rebecca. Now, this word Bethel is very interesting because this is the first time we see the word Syrian. So Bethel, it would appear is the first Syrian that we read about in the Bible, and Laban also. So this is the same Laban that we read about that provided the daughters for Jacob to have his 12 sons, and he also provided his daughter's maids to be Jacob's concubines. What's the difference between a wife and what's the difference between a concubine? So it would appear to me that Laban 
is Assyrian. And, and by nature, it's, it's telling me that Genesis 22, because this Bethel is Assyrian, so is Rebecca. So how does this happen? How does this happen? So they've all come out of the lineage so far of Shem and of Shem's thirdborn. How then does Bethel become Assyrian when it seems to me that it's the same mother and it's the same father? So this is where this scripture we're talking about in Deuteronomy this is where it really this is where it really starts to take shape for me now let us not forget the last time that jacob and laban meet so we know that laban really mucked J jacob around with all of his substance and his wages and and we read right through in chapter 31 in genesis that it's all about his cattle it's all about his rams. It's all about the conditions, whether they be rin straight or speckled or grizzled and, and things like that. It's all about the condition of these things that would appear uh, animals, but I'm saying mean far, far greater than, than just animals. And this is the last time that they meet, and it's all about these things. And we read here in, in verse 20 that Jacob stole away unawares to Laban the Syrian in that he told him that he not fled. So he took off. Jacob took off. And what does he do? He passes over the river. Now, I wonder what river this is. I wonder if this is the river Euphrates. I'll, I'll have a look and put it up on the screen. And set his face towards Mount Gilead. So he's passing over, right? So what is, what indeed is this passing over and what does all this mean? And remember, this is the chapter before that he meets God's host and he becomes Israel and he Mahanaim and everything becomes two with Jacob and he, and he meets Esau. But when we come down into verse 43, we can see that they make a covenant. Jacob and Laban make a covenant. And I thought I might just read through this just to see if we can make some sense of it. And Laban answered and said unto Jacob, These daughters are my daughters and these children are my children and these cattle are my cattle, and all that thou seest is mine. And what can I do this day unto these my daughters, or unto their children which they have borne? So this is telling me that Laban thinks that of the twelve, the twelve sons, and everything that Jacob got is his. Right? In Deuteronomy, we're reading, we're reading that that that, that Assyrian went down to went down to Egypt. Now, therefore, come down, let us make a covenant, I and thou, and it will be a witness between me and thee. And Jacob took a stone and set it up for a pillar. And Jacob said unto his brethren, Gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap, and they did eat there upon the heap. So this has been 12 sons, I think. And Laban called it, not even going to try that, and, but Jacob called it Gali. And I've had a look at both of those words, and they both just mean witness. And Laban said, This is a witness between me and thee this day, therefore the name of it was called Galilee. So, because they've agreed, it looks like that whatever Jacob said went. And this is where we come back into Mitzpah, right? The watchtower. The watchtower near Mount Hermon in Jabuk. And Mitzpah, for he said, The Lord watch between me and thee when we are absent from one another. Now, this one. If thou shalt afflict my daughters, or if thou shalt take other wives beside my daughters, no man is with us. See, God is witness betwixt me and thee. This is all about this mitzpah. Lord, watch between me and thee when we are absent from one another. So this is the father of the twelve tribes of Israel, and this is the man who provided the daughters and their maids to be Jacob's concubines who, who bear the 12 sons of the 12 tribes of Israel. And they, they, they commit to each other, and this pillar be a witness that I will not pass over this heap to thee, and that thou shall not pass over this heap, this pillar, unto me for harm. So it's almost most interesting. And then when we come back into Deuteronomy 36, we read that, And thou shalt speak and say before the Lord thy God, Assyrian ready to perish was my father. 
and he went down into Egypt and sojourned there with a few and there become a great nation, great, mighty and populous. So is this, is this giving us some clues about the role of the woman, exactly what a woman is and exactly why? Why are the scriptures defining a character which appears to be Jacob as a Syrian when the man, the father of his wives, was a Syrian? Now, let us not forget as well that this Deuteronomy 26 is the very same chapter that appears to be talking about the man tilling the ground in the land. If we read verse 9, and he hath brought us into this place and have given us this land, even a land that floweth with milk and honey, it almost seems like a perfect garden, doesn't it? A perfect garden where they've been where they've been placed to till the ground, and now behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land which thou, O Lord, hast given me, and thou shalt set it before the Lord thy God, and worship before the Lord thy God. It almost sounds like a perfect scene in Genesis two. So the woman was created to be a help meet for the man. And as you can see, the scriptures are taking us to this word shield and that the Lord is that shield. So I thought I'd have a look at the word shield and we see it means shield buckler. Now, straight away to me, they're host words. You see it over and over again. And when you see these words of war, to me, it's a, it's a host word, the, the shield and the sword and and all of these words. But we have a look at the Chaldees lexicon and we see here of God as a protector and it offers Genesis 15.1. And we also see my shield is with God. So there's a real theme emerging here because the woman was created. The reason why the woman was created was to be a help meet for the man and that word help, it's taking us to this word shield and you can see over and over again that this word shield is the Lord. The Lord is the shield for the man. And we see in Genesis 15, 1, after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. So who's the reward? The reward's the Lord Jesus Christ, right? The, the reward is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see here, and I put down in other videos, uh, the scriptures are leading me to think, that every time we see this word Lord, it's actually the Lord Jesus Christ talking. So we see it here. So the Lord is telling Abram that he is thy shield. And we see the words right through here, the word shield. In 1 Samuel one twenty one, for instance, this is just, this is all host. This is a host of the mighty is, vile, is vilely cast away. And we, we judges, the whole book of Judges is about the, is about the host, is about the spiritual war. So the woman was made to be a help meet for the man. And remember how we got there. These scriptures that it offers up in the Chaldees lexicon are telling us that it's all about a shield. And those scriptures are then telling us that this shield is the Lord. And remember Nehemiah 3.19, where we talk about Mizpah. Now the word meat, it's most interesting indeed. So it's basically what is what is conspicuous, what is in front of, straightforward, in your view, corresponding to, before, in the side of, parallel to, opposite, at a distance, that sort of thing, right? So right in front of your face, but it's the opposite and it's over there and it's parallel. The opposite. Now remember that the woman was when we have a look at that word woman H802, it's the opposite of H376. And that H376 is what Adam said that the Lord, so the Lord said that the woman H802 was taken out of the man H120, but Adam said, Adam H120, he said that the woman H02 was taken out of the man H376. And those two are the opposite to each other, H376 and H802. So we see that the help meet is really, to me, it's funnily enough, mirroring that. It's reflecting that. And that's sort of how I'm viewing this. That's, that's what I'm sort of seeing here. Now, we have a look at the scriptures that it offers up. I thought I'd have a look at a couple of those. 
So in Exodus 34, 10, this is a covenant. And behold, and he said, behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. So the covenant before, in front of. And I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with it. So the Lord making a covenant in front of opposite all the people. And first Samuel twelve. So this is when Samuel's about to die, and he's making he's making the Saul the king of, of Israel. And Samuel said unto all Israel, Behold, I have hearkened to you in your voice that you have said unto me, and I have made a king unto you. And now, behold, the, the king walketh before you, and I am old and grey-haired, and behold, my sons are with you, and I have walked before you from my childhood unto this day. Behold, here I am, witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Oxes till the ground, right? Oxes till the ground. We keep coming back here. And whose ass have I taken? Now, what do they do? What do they do? And who have I defrauded? Who have I oppressed? And whose hand have I received any bribe to blind my eyes therewith? And I will restore it. Here we go with restore, right? I'm going to get there again on this video. And as I go on, as I read the book of Deuteronomy, it's, it's, it, I've got reason to think that every man may have his own ox and have his own ass. So what is deed is a man. But that's not what we're doing here. We're doing what is a woman, aren't we? So we see here, witness against, in front of, the opposite. And Numbers 25, this one's most, most interesting. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom in the daughters of Moab. So this is just after the story of Balaam and Barak. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat. Now, it's not a physical thing. They didn't physical, physically eat of the sacrifices, they ate it spiritually. As most people do in the world today, they are eating of the sacrifices of all of these people who sell their soul. The Hollywood actors, for instance, the musicians, all of these people, the politicians, all of them, they're selling their soul to, to, to gain riches and glory, and all the people of the earth are eating of their sacrifice. And that's what they're saying here. That's, that, that is where the scriptures are leading me. That's how the scriptures are leading me to think. And Israel joined himself unto Balpur, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel against the sun. Goodness gracious me. So that's definitely a host word. And remember, Joseph was responsible. He had the blessing of all the precious fruits brought, brought, brought forth by the sun and by the moon. Now, as I make my way through my latest sojourn in the Old Testament, the very nature of this video is changing. I've still got so much more I want to do, and it's really, really hard to know right now where to stop. It's just incredible how much all this is all this is changing. And Right now, as I put this part of this video down, I'm up to Joshua 11, and my, 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 you'll see why I am acting the way I'm acting when it comes to Joshua 11 in, in just a few minutes. But a, a few scriptures that I've been reading as I've done this video, and a couple that I've read recently, just before I started this video, it just, it just, it just gives you the... Like front and center, it just shows you just the, the, the majesty and the magnificence of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost, the way he just leads you into, into these fruits and the way I'm reading these scriptures now and just the, the clarity the Holy Ghost is giving me right now. It's just, it's really, really, it's like, why me, Lord? It's just, it's, it's, it's fantastic. I just love every minute of it. But back to, we're back to Leviticus, right? So Leviticus 18, verse 7, the nakedness of thy father... Or the nakedness of thy mother, shalt thou not uncover. She is thy mother, thou shalt not cover her nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife, thou shalt not uncover. It is thy father's nakedness. So let's really break down verse 8 here, right? So the, the nakedness, so what's naked mean? It's, is it physically nutty or does it mean something else? I, I believe it's something else and I think after the next few minutes you may very well think the same if you don't already. I believe it's potentially a covering 
dare I say, a shield. This is where the, this is where the scriptures are leading you, right? Because so far from Genesis 2, we know that the woman was created to be a helpmeet, and those words help and meet mean an aid, secure, and the Chaldees lexicon is taking us to the word shield. And meet means in front of, against, opposite, a mirror, really, the way, the way I'm reading that as well. So that's what this help meet was. And the scriptures are leading us to this word shield is the Lord. It's not the woman, it's the Lord. So is that, because it's got something to do with the fall in, in Genesis 3, because she, she, whatever, whatever the truth is of the, of the woman's purpose as to why she was created, Genesis 3 tells us she, she cataclysmically failed and the, all those New Testament scriptures tell us that as well. So the father, the father has a covering and the wife has a covering. She's got, we've got the mother in, in verse 7 and the father that they've both got covering and you can't uncover their nakedness. Now, what's, what's the father's covering? The father's covering is, the, is his wife, is it not? The nakedness of thy father's wife, thou shalt not cover it is thy father's nakedness. So that thing before it, which is the wife, you can't uncover her nakedness, otherwise you're gonna you're gonna uncover the nakedness of the father, of the man, the covering, the shield. Right? Now how far do we go here? What's a father? Like what's a father? I, I thought I'd have a little bit of a look at that. And it's H1. Look at that. It's a funny old thing. It's H H1. It's the first Hebrew word. And we see the words here where it's where it's translated out. And as I go on, each time I see this word father, to me it's representing a prince, a spiritual ruler, somebody who we we hear it in the world a lot. They are the father. So somebody who started something. They are the father of that thing and we read in the scriptures that that's what it is as well so in genesis 4 in verse 20 and adar bear jabal he was the father of such as dwell in tents and have such as cattle so he was the first so he's the father he's the spiritual ruler of all of these things and then i come down into genesis 9 we're going to get there again um, genesis 9 22 and ham the father of canaan so it was ham the spiritual ruler of the Canaanites. Who were the Canaanites and why were in the land? Why were they in the land? And how far do I go on this video? Just how far do I go? Because at the moment, if I just keep going and put everything down that I want to put down, I'll go for hours this. Hours. Just there's so much here. There's so much here. Now, Deuteronomy 37, I read this this morning. Now, this is where Moses divided. Yes, there's that word divided, the 12 tribes of Israel. And he told five of the tribes to go to one mountain, six of the tribes to go to the other because the Levites weren't involved in all this. So it was five to one and, and, and six to the other. Half of the tribes went to Gerzrium to bless the people and the other half went to Ebal to curse the people. And we, we come down into some scriptures here. Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image. So we're talking about this stuff, right? And we come down into verse 17. Cursed be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say, Amen. Landmark. So straight away, that word captured my attention. I thought, what is a landmark? Let's go and have a look. Check it out. Border, territory, border, region, enclosed with boundary. Like, it's almost like it's a shield, a protective barrier, a casing, a womb. Even this is where it's leading me. And I've been putting down this thought for a while. This is how the land of Canaan to me feels. That it feels like it's a protective barrier. It's a protective shield from the rest of the world. And they could do, they could dwell there as long as they like. But they just had to hearken to the voice of the Lord, and they couldn't let any other people in. And they couldn't let any sin in. And they, 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 and they failed. And they failed. And and and. It seems to me that the Canaanites did as well. There's scriptures there to say that the Canaanites were given the, the same opportunity and they too failed. And that's why the Israelites came in to, 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 to drive them out. But here we've got bound as well, right? We've got the word bound and we've got all of these words that we've been talking about with, these, with, this, with this shield, with this barrier, with this covering. Remember, that's, that's what the help meet was. That's what the woman was. It was the... 
it was the covering. So if we come back now to Deuteronomy, cursed be them, cursed be he that removes his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say Amen. So what's a neighbor? What's a neighbor here? It's a different H number to Zechariah thirteen seven. It's a different H number. Is it pertaining to another person, or is it spirit flesh? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But this is the word that we read right through Joshua. So as I say, I'm up to I'm up to Joshua at the moment, and tonight I should be reading through these scriptures here, where where we divide we divide the land of Canaan up by their coasts and their borders, and it's the same word. This is the same Hebrew word as we read in landmark. We see some of the scriptures here, but I instantly thought of this scripture that I've shared on this channel before. So this one really hit me my last read through of the Old Testament, 2 Kings 15 and 16, their Mahanim, smoke Tipsar, and all that were therein, and the coast thereof from Terzar, because they opened not to him, therefore he smote it, and he ripped all the women therein that were with child, he ripped up. So check that one out, right? It's the same word as landmark that we read in Deuteronomy. So when we come in now and have a look at this word Tipsar, it means cross over, doesn't it? It means cross over. So is this maybe where they pass over? What this passing over and what Jacob was doing in Genesis when they go on to the other side? And Because it's right on the Euphrates, isn't it? It's a place at the northeast limit of Solomon's empire located on the Euphrates River. So it's right at the limit of Solomon's empire, right at the limit of the bound, right at the limit of the border, right at the limit of the covering. That is the land of Canaan, and it's shield, the shield. The, 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 the woman was created to be the helpmate, the shield, but she failed at that, and now the Lord is the shield. So what is a woman? What is a woman? Check out Meaning B, a place in the northern kingdom of Israel where King Mahanim attacked and where he ripped open all the pregnant women. All the pregnant women. So let's have a look at the scripture again. And Mahanim smoked Tipsar, and all that were therein, and all the coasts thereof from Terzar, because they opened not to him before he smote, therefore he smote them. And all the women therein were ripped, which child were ripped up. So the, what about that, eh? What about that? So when we now come back into to Deuteronomy, it just keeps going, as I say. As I say, it keeps going. Cursed be he that lieth with his father's wife, because he uncovereth, here we go with uncovereth, right? His father's skirt, and all the people shall say, Amen. I thought, you, you can imagine what I thought. I thought two things. I thought uncovereth. I thought lots of things. I thought uncovereth. I thought covereth. And I thought, oh, this word skirt. Now, when we have a look at the word uncover, we can see it's pretty well what we, we think it might be. To, to, to be removed, to uncover, to remove, to, to, to go into exile, that's interesting, to uncover oneself. Nakedness. So here we go with all these nakedness words, right? But have a ch check out the first one. And he drank of the wine and was drunken and was uncovered within his tent. So let's go back to Deuteronomy. Cursed be he that lieth with his father's wife, because he uncovereth his father's skirt. And all the people shall say, Amen. So, what does layeth with, with a wife mean now? And, and, and this is the covering. So, this is the actual covering of the man. It's his covering. It's the help me. Is it because we, we read the scripture over and over again, don't we? We read the scripture over and over again that the Lord, that the Lord is the shield. But we're now reading here that it's the woman. It's the woman as well. So what is a woman? What indeed, what indeed is a woman? And we see a couple of other scriptures here. And we, we have the ones here. We, we come back into Leviticus 18, 7. The nakedness of thy father and the nakedness of thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover. She is thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife. Thou shalt not uncover, it is thy father's nakedness. So the woman is a is a shield, is a covering, is a covering for the man. And the scriptures are telling us that that shield is the Lord. So now this word skirt. So what's this word skirt, right? So cursed be he that lie with his father's wife, because he uncovereth his father's skirt, and all the people shall say, Amen. So let's have a look at this word skirt. Check it out. Wing, 
wing 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 so we've just talked about uncover right and who who was the cherubim that covereth who was the cherubim that covereth that was in what was in eden the garden of god mm. so we've got wing extremity edge winged border corner shirt wing extremity skirt corner of a garment corner of a garment and i just i go all sorts of places here but let's check out some scriptures right so we've got the wing fowl and we've got all of these scriptures here in genesis and, and, and exodus but look at the ones in exodus and the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high covering the mercy seat with their wings Cursed be he that lieth with his father's wife, because he uncovereth his father's skirt, wings, cherubim, cherubim that covereth. The help meet is a shield, and that shields the Lord. What? Oh, what? Oh, what? Is a woman. Now, there was a day when the sons of God went into the daughters of men, wasn't there? Now, who are they? Who are the sons of God who are the daughters of men? And remember, everything in this house is up for discussion because we've been lied to our whole lives. And we're just a little bit sick of it. So we're going to get all of our discernment from the scriptures and the Holy Spirit, aren't we? So who, who were they? So I'll come back to that because Corinthians might give us a bit of a clue. So as I say, as I say, I've really got to decide now how far I'm going to go with this video because we're already been going well over an hour and I haven't even started on the New Testament yet and the New Testament things really, really start to hot up with all this, really starts to get interesting. So I think what I'll do is I'll leave this one on this last bit, this last point, that these last scriptures that, that I'm about to share and then we'll put this one to bed and we'll, we'll see if we can do a second video on all this. But... I don't know, 1 Corinthians 11 has really changed for me since I started doing this video. Verse 7, For the man indeed ought not to cover his head, for so much as he is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is for the glory of the man. So the man was, was created in the image of God, male and female created he them, and he was created to till the ground, and to dress and keep the Garden of Eden. And the woman is the, for the glory of the man to, to, to be a helpmeet, a covering, a shield, the opposite, right in front of a helpmeet of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. So it's all sort of making, up, making sense with what we've been talking about on this video. This, And for this cause, ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Now that scripture, that verse 10, every time I've read 1 Corinthians, I'm like, what could that mean? For the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. If we come back to Genesis 6, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men. I just, I don't know, I just wonder whether there's something in that, whether there's some sort of connection, because we know now that those of us in the body of Christ, well, the New Testament says it, the New Testament says that those that are begotten again in the body of Christ, they're the sons of God, and we want to be blameless in a perverse generation, we, we read there in Philippians. And in verse 4, there were giants on the earth in those days and also after that. And that's true because right, reading right through Deuteronomy, and I just finished Joshua this morning, that there's giants in the land of Canaan, but they don't seem to be anywhere else, right? They don't, I haven't seen or heard of a giant anywhere else but in the land of Canaan, of which for me is really by the day is feeling more and more like the Garden of Eden. And the cherubim were there to covereth. The cherubim were there to covereth, and the woman was there to covereth. Well, she was there for a help meet, the covering, the shield. I don't know. I don't know. I just feel a connection here. I just feel some sort of connection. Are we getting into? 
the great feminine spirit. Are we getting into First Timothy 2 here that I suffer not a woman to teach? Is this where the Holy Spirit's leading me here? I, I, I don't know. I've really been thinking on this long and hard, long and hard. But And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bare children to them and they became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Now, this is their host words. It's, to me, they're spiritual beings, these giants. They're, they're spiritual beings. Whether they manifest physically, probably. They probably do. You look at the people that are running the world today and you think, yes, there's probably giants in the earth still in, the, in these days. But most certainly after those days, because we just, I've just read all about them in Deuteronomy and in, and in the book of Joshua. But are these, are these the giants? So the children bear to them, are they the giants? There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bear children to them. So does that connect the giants and the sons of God? Potentially. It feels like it could. It feels like it could. Joshua 11. So this is where I'm going to leave this video today. So Joshua 11, I just read it there yesterday. And this is just after that the, the Joshua comes in and he smotes the five kings of of the land and there was one out of Chesedisek. He he appears to be the he was the ruler, he was the, the king of, of Jerusalem. And it seems to me that in the land of Canaan there was an opposite to the Israelites. Everything had an opposite. For instance, out of Chesedisek. He was the king of, of Jerusalem in the land of Canaan, but Melchizedek was the king of Jerusalem as well. So, the, and, and these Israelites, they took over the land and they replaced it. They replaced that with this. They seem to be the opposite, the what's right in front of you, the help meet, the meat part of the, of the help, the, the, the opposite potentially the covering that was in God's garden before these children of Israel went in there. I, I, I don't know. I'm really trying to lift my eyes with this and trying to get out of the modern day and where we are and really try to get, get, get the meat into this. And it's like, we know, we know the prince, the king of Tyre was the cherubim that covereth. We know that. Ezekiel tells us that. So he, he, he was the covering. So was the he the help me? I think this is what I'm trying to say here. Was he the help me? Were these Canaanites supposed to be the help me? Is this what the fall potentially was? I, 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 I just read these scriptures and I really, these are just ideas, okay? I'm no teacher. I'm a student. I've got no one to talk to. And I'm just trying to make sense of all this. But in Joshua, so all of these things have just happened, and Joshua hung the kings from the tree and and put them in the in the tomb and with the with the rock that rolled in front of it, with the scene that was very reminiscent to Jesus. And Joshua and Jesus both mean Jehovah is salvation, and there's just connections after connection to to Joshua and Jesus. And but in any case, and it come to pass when Jabin the king of Hazor had heard these things, he sent unto jo Jobab the king of Maiden. And, and to the king of Shimrod, and to the king of, not even going to try and say that, and to the kings that were in the north of the mountains, and to the plain south of Chinneroth, and in the valley, and the borders of Dor on the west, and to the Canaanite on the east, and on the west, and to the Amorite, the Hittite, the Persite, the Jebusite, the mountains, and to the Hivite, under Herm, and the land of Mizpah. So I'm sitting there at the shops, I took my glasses off, I put my Bible down, and I just went, Wow! Given that what I'm doing, what I'm reading in this, at, at, what, what I'm talking about at the moment on this video, and I just read that, and then verse 4, and they went out, and they went out, right? So they went out through the gate. They went out through the gate. They and all their hosts, out they went. And I keep reading. I keep reading in, in the book of Joshua towards the sun rising, towards the sun rising. It's just, it's becoming more and more celestial to me, this book. And they went out they and all their hosts with them much people even as the sand that is upon the seashore that sounds familiar doesn't it in multitude with horses and chariots very many so jeremiah 5 verse 22 fear fear ye not me saith the lord we would not tremble at my presence which have placed the sand for the bound of the sea 
by a perpetual decree that it cannot pass it, passing over, right? And though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot pass over it. Passing over. Here we go again, right? So the, the when, a, when a woman gives birth, she breaks the waters on her womb, right? It, 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 the, the, seal, the seal is broken and the waters come out. But it's bound by water. It's bound by a sea. So remember, Galilee means circuit. It's a circuit. It's round. Does that mean round? But it's a circle, right? It's a circuit and it's water. And it's a protective barrier of the land of Canaan. And it's surrounded by all of these cities that Solomon gave up. Solomon gave up all of these cities to the king of Tyre, who we read in Ezekiel 28 is the cherubim that covereth. And when Solomon took his 700 wives, this is when the king of Tyre breached. He breached the waters of the womb. Remember, Jesus was walking the, walking the shores of Galilee the whole time he was on the earth. So we come back to Joshua now, and we see all of these, are these giants, Canaanites and Persasites and Jebusites and the Hivites and Hermon and I, I, I'm just, I'm just right now. I'm, I'm of the view that potentially these, these things, these beings, could well have been the giants. And these people, these beings, these nations, they were put there. They were afforded the same opportunity before the children of Israel in the land of Canaan, which potentially is the Garden of Eden. And is, does this maybe explain to us why the serpent was there? Because there's scriptures there to say that I shared in my last video, the scriptures there to say that the Canaanites potentially were there before the children. Because why were they there? Why were they there? How did they get there? Why were they in God's land? And it seems like they were nowhere else, right? It seems like they were nowhere else. So why were they there? So it seems to me that the Lord has given them, and the scriptures are leading me to think, that the Lord put them there. He put them there to till the ground, perhaps? Perhaps, maybe, I don't know. But we know, we know that the that the king of Tyre was the cherubim that covereth, and the, and and Ezekiel twenty eight seems to be explaining what Isaiah fourteen explains as Lucifer that he was bright and he was magnificent and he was he got full of himself because he was glorious, he was beautiful, and just what the world talk about Lucifer, exactly what they talk about him, that he's 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 beautiful and he's a he's a He's a false light and he's a false sunlight and that's why they worship their Venus and the light because he's the false dawn and and all this sort of stuff. And it's the, the, the scriptures are telling this as they said, he was the anointed cherub that covereth that he had wings and and the man, the man had a skirt and it's just what did, what does all this mean? And as I say, I could go on and on. So let's try and wrap this up. So we have a look at the word Herman. It means now Herman, right? That that book of Enoch, which I've rejected now, I, I I don't I don't I don't think I've rejected it, but I just I'm I'm not reading it anymore. I'm not taking discernment from it because there's nothing in the scripture to say that it should be in. And I found when I read it, I found in the different versions, I found that there was just outright contradictions with each other. It just one said one thing and one said another. It's all right to have different versions of things and the different abomination Bible um, verses and all uh, versions and all that. But but these these different versions, they just completely contradicted each other. It was in verse oh, around 43 for memory. There were three verses where it talked about the elect the elect of the angels and the stars were Enoch saw them and I'm not saying it's not in but I'm saying that I'm I'm very wary of it and I'm not taking any discernment from it anymore but in any case that's the book that's the book where it says that the watches fell that these watches watches sounds a bit like watchtower mitzvah right doesn't it it's a, to me watchtower and watches are potentially the same thing and remember this is the last time that Jacob and Laban met each other in Genesis 31. There's the last time they met each other, it was all about the strife because they, they both said the substance was theirs and Laban the Syrian. And then we talk about that scripture in Deuteronomy about the Syrian. It's just like, ah, my head is, my head is seriously, seriously spinning. So Herman, that's what they say it is. And I just think my, my instinct and just everything in my body tells me that this Mount Herman is what they call Antarctica. Because Antarctica doesn't exist. 
it's not real because the earth's not a ball it's do it does not exist there's no actual footage of it it's cloaked in lies it's cloaked in secrecy and any time like north korea anything that's cloaked in secrecy you know it doesn't exist north korea doesn't exist Kim Jong-un is just from Switzerland. Even the internet will tell you that Kim Jong-un is from Switzerland, which is the pits of hell on, on, the, on the earth today. So is this, is this where these fallen angels, is there such a thing as fallen angels, but is this what this event in Genesis 6, is this where it took place in this Hermon? And remember, Mitzpah is right near Hermon, and remember, Mitzpah means watchtower. So, and it was to be a watch between Jacob and between Laban, who who supplied the daughters, the, the the women and the maids for Jacob to get Jacob to go into to begat the twelve tribes of Israel. So Hermon means century, a mountain on the northeastern border of Palestine and Lebanon, and overlooking the border by city Dan. So it doesn't really give us much in the scriptures as to what it is, but uh, uh, what it's all about. But as I read through the scriptures. There are connections there. There's, 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 you can't make that final connection that Herman is of the giants, but I think the scriptures tell us that they've got something to do with the giants. And jo jo Joshua 12, 1 here, this is what I was sort of saying before. So now these are the kings of the land which the children of Israel smote and possessed their land on the other side of Jordan. The other side, right? Towards the rising of the sun. See, see what I mean? So it's on the other side towards the rising of the sun. Why? Why? Why does the Bible just talk about the rising of the sun? Well, you know, and you talk about Tammuz and, and, and Ezekiel 8 and where they're worshipping the sun and they're in the gate of the Lord's house. And I, 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 could, I could just go on and on and on. So, so the man was created to till the ground and to dress and to keep the Garden of Eden, the woman was created as a helpmate to help the man do this to be what appears to be their shield. Now the law, now the scriptures is telling us now that that shield is the Lord, but the scriptures is also telling us that the woman, that the woman is the covering because if you uncover the woman's nakedness, then you're uncovering the nakedness of the man, the shield, the cherubim perhaps that covereth, I don't know. But right through, right through the scriptures, it says, it says that what part of the sin of the children of Israel was that they cleaved. They cleaved to the to the gods of the land, to the people of the land, and they cleaved to their strange gods. And the Lord was most upset because he wanted them to cleave to him, but they were cleaving to these strange gods of the land. Now, who who is the husband today and who is the bride? Who is the husband and who is the bride? And is the Lord Jesus Christ, is he our shield? Is he our shield? So there was a day where the sons of God, right, they went into the daughters of men. So they committed a heinous sin, a heinous sin. But now the sons of God are good people, aren't they? It feels like everything's been turned around. Everything's been turned around on its head. It's like it's it's a story that starts and then it's 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 finishing the way it was. It's fixing what was broken and it's now coming back to to what it was. And I'm really that's where the scriptures are leading me. This is how I'm really starting to think and and I'm just trying. I keep reading as I read the scriptures. Lift up their eyes when they lifted up their their eyes. They saw and we're awake, aren't we? We're awake, but we're still under the Masonic spell because we don't know. We don't have the wisdom of Solomon. There's still so many things that we don't know. And every day, every day I see something, I go, wow, 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 wow. And that's where you can't be pride. It's not about being right. It's not about being wrong. It's not about being embarrassed when you're wrong. It's not about going, oh, my goodness, they lied to me or... I walk with the Lord, so I got all this wisdom and I know all this stuff and nobody can tell me anything. And you just find yourself teaching, 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 teaching. No, we're pupils. We will always remain a pupil. I will be a pupil until the day I die or until the Lord Jesus Christ tells me I'm something different. But I will be a pupil of the scriptures. And as long as the Lord keeps, keeps allowing me and seems to want me to continue on, this is what we will be doing 
in this house. We will continue to share what the scriptures and what the Holy Spirit is leading, uh, is teaching me. So this has been an amazing experience putting this video together, guys. It's been the best part of the week. Probably by the time I get it up, it'll be a week. And it's by far the longest one I've did. So if you've got that, got to the end, I really, really appreciate it. It's As you know, I am a warrior. I am a warrior in the name of truth, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm fearless when it comes to the truth. If I'm wrong with things, I will repent. I don't care if I'm wrong. Being right's good because if you're right, it means you're on the right path and you can continue on in your search for truth. But if you're wrong, it means you have to take a backward step and you just have to rethink a lot of things and, and basically start again in a lot of areas. But whether I'm right or wrong, it's inconsequential. All I want is the truth. And I know if you've got to the end of this video, I know that's what you want in your heart as well. In any case, in any case, here it is. There's still so much, so, so much more so much more I want to share about this. So the, the word Eve, the word Eve is quite incredible. It brings it brings a lot of scriptures in the New Testament to life. There's, then there was 2 Corinthians 11. Go and have a look at that. But 2 Corinthians 11, 2 Corinthians 11 now, when you have a look at this word Eve, it's just blown my mind. It is telling me, it is telling me that, I'll just read it out here, verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as a serpent beguiled Eve, though through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So it's amazing, amazing stuff. As I say, it just feels as though the whole story is, is being told backwards to fix something that was lost as the Lord Jesus Christ said he's, he's, he's come back to fix what was once lost so it is indeed a, a, we, we are we are the woman aren't we we are the virgin we're the husband we are the we are the wife we are the woman to the Lord Jesus Christ it, it says it there in second Corinthians and it tells us in Matthew the story of the ten virgins where five had oil in them the other five didn't have oil and time and time again. We need to be brave. We need to just want the truth. Something clearly is happening in the earth. There's something huge brewing in the earth. But cleave, cleave, there's a good word, eh? You cleave to the Lord Jesus Christ, the giver of all truth, the giver of all mercy. And I'm on my knees every day praising him, praising him because the life he's given me and the truth he's bringing into me is amazing. So I can't believe it. This video is over. It's been an amazing experience. And as usual, I'd love to hear from you if you so feel led. All right, my brothers and sisters, what a, what indeed is a woman. I feel as though we're that, we're that much, much closer. All right, and all power and all glory goes to the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour, the King. And one's left standing still I wish we'd all been ready There's no time to change your mind The sun has come